Welcome to Taiwan Talks, covering the latest global news from a Taiwan perspective. I'm Albert Cho. The recent visit of Vice President Lai Qingde to Paraguay and his transit to the United States prompted a response from the PLA, a three-day military drill, though not near Taiwan. A central question arises, can the PLA's military threats deter high-level U.S. Taiwan visits? Joining us today are Alexander Huang, Director and U.S. Representative, Kenti International Affairs, and Arthur Dean, Emeritus Professor of International Affairs at the National Zhengzhi University. A very warm welcome to all on the show. Okay, uh, let's assess the arguments that the future PLA response uh, could weaken due to frequent high-level visits between U.S. and Taiwan. So are there any methods that show the war which the PLA could use to pressure Taiwan in the future? Professor Huang, what's your take on this? I, I think um, the, the PLA had exercise mm -hmm. uh, actually surrounding Taiwan mm -hmm. uh, since August uh, 2022. And they continued uh, that kind of practice or military drills, uh, which in a special term called normalized uh, combat readiness patrol, mm -hmm. uh, basically surrounding Taiwan with a range of 24 nautical miles. Um, we do not believe that it is a special uh, pressure uh, after William Lai's visit or, or transit through the United States. Um, they uh, had um, occasionally mm -hmm. um, uh, put bigger pressure uh, around Taiwan. But to your question, I have to say that uh, the, the PLA's practice um, may not work uh, as before uh, because uh, the Taiwan general public had known their tactics. Uh, they had tried that before. Um, I, I believe that uh, PLA, with their own reason, they will continue to uh, react to any senior level visit uh, either way mm -hmm. uh, from the United States to Taiwan or Taiwan through the United States. Uh, but the, the political impact may not be as strong as they expected. Mm -hmm. So Professor uh, Dean, do you agree with Professor Huang's uh, argument that uh, uh, the PLA's response to any kind of uh, visit from Taiwan to the Western world uh, may not work in the future? Um, well, I would say I, w I want to add something uh, upon uh, Alexander Professor Huang's uh, argument that the, if we re if we look at the read the the the, the platform uh, announced in the party con party congress CCP, they say they, they need to control the initiative and uh, control the dominance. Uh, so I guess you know this is the so-called military action in the Taiwan area is a part of this their, uh, you know, the approach or methods they use for control the initiative and, and, uh, uh <coughs> and uh, so-called dominance. But I would say uh, because there's a kind of a strong uh, sense in inside China, this is you make a, a circle that the, they have to make a, a strong uh, reaction, uh, reaction against whatever Taiwan's effort to improve the relation with the, the, the outside Western countries. So, um, so whoever they perceive, you know, the Taiwan's diplomatic uh, diplomacy has been improved or has been heightened, then they have to take a much stronger reaction mm -hmm. to uh, our effort. Mm -hmm. So I would say uh, uh <coughs> China will do whatever they, they, they can take uh, short of war at, at this stage because it seems uh, so-called all-out invasion is not in their plan yet, but uh, I would say they will continue to exert this kind of a military pressure uh, for for us. But where Taiwan, uh, where how this impact Taiwan? I would say in general, the kind of a consensus between blue and uh, green in Taiwan society is that uh, we need to have our so-called international st uh, space or international status. Okay, uh, let's kind of shift the gear a bit, talk about China's economy. Uh, Professor Huang, could you share insights on how China's struggling economy influences President Xi's decisions regarding actions against Taiwan? Well, we used to say that even a skinny camel mm -hmm. is bigger than a strong a horse. So uh, with China being enjoying the status as the number one trading nation and uh, number two economy, in the world. 
I think uh, even they suffered a downturn or a uh, temporal difficulties. Uh, I think still people in Taiwan should be very vigilant about uh, the potential impact of such actions that uh, even with the economic um, suffering or, 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 or uh, uh, bad performance, it doesn't mean that uh, Beijing would uh, give away their potential options uh, by using force to coerce Taiwan. Uh, as we said before, that uh, or the Chinese, uh, they say uh, for themselves that the uh, Taiwan issue is the core of their core interests. Um, and uh, we have to be very careful uh, that we understand that we have a strong support from international community. We have a strong force to defend Taiwan. Uh, but uh, still, I have to say that we don't need to uh, provoke uh, Beijing unnecessarily, in a sense. Right, but the question is, on the other hand, do, do you believe that China's economic recession will stabilize or destabilize the situation in the Taiwan Straits? I, I think uh, the jury is still out there. Uh, you know, no one can tell uh, their decision-making process. Um, they may, you know, by theory, they can, either way they can do harm to Taiwan. You know, we have seen so many papers arguing different uh, angles of analysis. Uh, personally, I believe that a weaker Chinese economy becomes more sensitive uh, to the possible international response to their military actions against Taiwan, especially since the Ukraine war. Mm. Okay, um, let's shift the focus on the Latin America. Uh, then also the question <coughs> goes to uh, Professor Dean. Do you foresee Paraguay as the next country to severe ties with Taiwan, uh, following far other countries in the middle America? Well, um, we all know that the, the election outcome in the Paraguay and uh, the new president uh, has publicly said that the, uh, they want to maintain the relationship with us. Uh, uh, and uh, there's no doubt our government also paid tr a tremendous effort to build a closer relationship wi with, with the new government. So uh, from what I can see uh, in, in the near future, at least probably in, uh, in his first term, you know, uh, I don't see any kind of a, a, a problem for the, uh, our diplomatic relation with Paraguay. But we, we need to know that the, the, the Beijing really uh, uh, also working hard and have a so-called a commercial office uh, and a commercial relationship with Paraguay. So um, uh, we really need to work hard and uh, uh, maintain our vi vigilance, I would say, uh, in order to maintain our relationship. Yeah. Professor Huang, you mm. are a uh, U.S. representative um, mm -hmm. in, on behalf of KMT. So w w what's your assessment of uh, Paraguay's relationship with Taiwan? I, I think mm. for many of our diplomatic partners uh, before and currently, uh, they have different political parties. They are also a democracy. Sometimes different political party would, um, you know, roll out different campaign, you know, languages uh, during their political race. I would say that most of the uh, Latin American countries would honor their friendship with Taiwan, but also in most recent decade. Uh, they are looking at more and more of their possible economic uh, gain if they get closer uh, to Beijing. Mm. Um, I think basically people uh, here in Taiwan understand that, uh, th that China had many items in their toolbox uh, to convince our uh, diplomatic um, allies to switch uh, recognition, um, but but still uh, we do our part. You know, it is an honor to be a Foreign Service officer for Taiwan. Uh, we are an other dog. We are excluded from most of the international organizations. It is up to our strong will and determination mm -hmm. to continue to protect and defend our rights. Uh, to maintain 
diplomatic relationship. Okay, we still have to be aware of China's any kind of potential <laughs> military threat. So, uh, Professor Tin, do you think the military threats from the uh, from the PLA is kind of going to influence Taiwan's uh, election next year? Um, if we look at the uh, pre uh, previous uh, record, uh, previously China believed uh, that this kind of military pressure uh, could impact our and uh, heavily influence our election. But w for instance, in the year 1996 and uh, year 2000, but the uh, outcome actually was the opposite and uh, quite disappointed to Beijing's expectation, frankly speaking. So I think Beijing also learned some so-called lesson. Uh, so uh, when I, my own guess is that uh, when approaching the our election uh, uh, voting days, they probably will lower the intensity or the, the sophistication of the, the military exercise in the town area, I guess, because they don't want to uh, you know, make the same mistake again, you know, the stupid mistake. So, uh, um, so this means that the uh, be probably Beijing don't believe the, uh, the, the military pressure probably is the base, uh, if not, uh, is not a better one, if not, if not the base uh, method to influence our election. Yeah. Okay, um, let's now hear from Edward uh, Wittenstein at the Yale Jackson School of Global Affairs, who highlights the importance of contesting gray zone activities as well as emphasizing the need for Taiwan and its allies to confront any potential blockade by China as an unlawful attempt to alter the status quo. Let's take a look. What potential impact would China imposing a blockade on Taiwan have on the region's stability? and Taiwan's economic and political landscape? First of all, a blockade in itself is unlawful. A blockade by China would be uh, an illegal act of war, uh, recognized under international law as an act of aggression. Any form of, of naval or enforced blockade uh, would be a violation in that regard. So it would be incumbent upon the United States and the world to reject uh, that form of aggression under international law um, in, in the strongest terms. So uh, any acceptance of that as a new status quo would be disastrous to, to Taiwan and, and the region. So to defend against the blockade, first of all, it's a very large geographic area. It would be a, a very aggressive move by China. You can think of efforts to uh, make blockading of the area uh, uninhabitable. So things like the mining program that the United States has supported in Taiwan are very helpful in that regard. And a willingness to, uh, you know, if, if necessary, break any unlawful blockade and challenge it uh, through force. And so I think a, a willingness, a stated willingness on the part by the United States and its allies about how they would regard a blockade um, as an unlawful effort to alter the status quo. That's an important step in that regard. There are things that uh, Taiwan and partners can do in a blockade scenario. For instance, whether the blockade would affect just Taiwanese or international vessels is an important question. So you could envision a coalition of international partners who are willing to provide their own vessels uh, in transit to and from Taiwan. And of course, any effort to stop or hinder or board or destroy those vessels would be an act of aggression by China uh, against those countries. So that would broaden the conflict and likely create great peril for China. Mm -hmm. So those are just a few areas that I think would make a, a significant um, advantage in, in the blockade scenario. But we know that China have been um, have engaged in so-called gray zone warfare, conducting a series of uh, activities in the uh, uh, water surrounding Taiwan. How would then Taiwan uh, look at these situations and develop uh, counter actions towards this type of a gray zone warfare? It's incumbent upon. Taiwan and its partners in the region to similarly contest those efforts in the gray zone, uh, again, below conflict. So in the event of uh, any obstruction, uh, it would be 
fair in my view to uh, obstruct or investigate and think of ways to challenge any effort to alter uh, the course of, of commercial vessels. And no doubt China is planning for uh, blockade scenarios, but again, it's similar to how Taiwan uh, is planning for anti-blockade scenarios. So in some ways, these defense exercises actually have a important deterrent and messaging effect. A any blockade at, at the scale that you're talking about that would move beyond the gray zone could bring about significant international condemnation, likely the involvement of the United States and other nations. Professor Huang, uh, Professor uh, Wittenstein talked about the blockade mm -hmm. and also the so-called gray zone affairs. Uh, they are short of war scale. So w w what's your estimation of this likelihood for the well, period? Well, the, the gray zone mm -hmm. tactics uh, have been in practice mm -hmm. um, primarily by the People's Liberation Army. Uh, of course, we understand gray zone operations is not limited to military options. There are other cyber and uh, economic coercion. Um, but talking about blockade, um, you know, to be honest, uh, as a military specialist, uh, to exercise a full blockade against Taiwan is so difficult. It could be broken, uh, you know, by easily. Uh, but a partial blockade or a coercive targeted quarantine against shippings to Taiwan, that can be done. And uh, Taiwan would have a hard time to maintain our energy supply and uh, other cargoes that are com coming into Taiwan. So we are very vigilant about uh, th these uh, gray zone tactics. Um, whether it uh, can coerce Taiwan and whether international community will react to that, it depends on the scenarios. I, I think certain contingencies that affecting not only the shipping to Taiwan, but the maritime transportation, avia civil aviation to Northeast Asia, then I believe that the entire region will react. Mm -hmm. And don't forget, that any coercive <coughs> military actions against Taipei would bring, uh, you know, impact and negative impact to Beijing and to their own commercial shipping as well. Mm -hmm. So I would urge uh, the regional countries, especially uh, those decision makers in Beijing, uh, to put all these factors into consideration. Okay, uh, let's come back to the attitudes of the United States. Some political analysts argue that President Joe Biden and Secretary of the State Antony Blinken are increasingly adopting a conciliatory stance towards China uh, to avoid a confrontation and minimizing involvement in the events of a Taiwan inc contingency. So do you share this perspective, uh, Professor Dean? Well, um, I, I did hear this kind of uh, uh, opinion and observation these days. Uh, arguing that the uh, 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 U.S. now is uh, somewhat uh, softer than than earlier under Biden administration, uh, but I guess you know um <coughs> they probably have something to do with. Uh, I I don't know the real story, frankly speaking, but I guess you know uh, uh, when I look at the political uh, calendars uh, for Biden administration. Uh, toward the end of the y this year, there are two uh, couple of major events like APEC uh, in the San Francisco and the G20 in India. This is one uh, aspect. Another is aspect is the uh, for pri President Biden's political agenda, he he is going to run re-election, and uh, domestically he has some pressure from his uh, camps. For instance, those advocating so-called climate change. Maybe uh, pressure him, try to do more and working more hard, try to solve this kind of global issues. And we know that the United States and China is the number one and number two economic power, and uh, they have a huge influence in climate change. So I guess you know uh, uh, this maybe can partially explain why, uh, if they did have somewhat solved. Uh, the, the, the President Biden and the Secretary uh, Blinken uh, to show a little bit the soft approach toward the Beijing uh, in these days. Because, um, you know, uh, uh, maybe uh, 
President Biden want to create a somewhat a good atmosphere. Uh, in, then they can walk in, talk with, sit down, talk with President uh, Xi Jinping in probably in APEC or in the G20, and uh, both of them can work uh, somewhat the solution, work together, try to solve the uh, the climate change, uh, climate issue. Then uh, this kind of a solution can indirectly help President Biden's re-election. So, you know, uh, inevitably every political leader has its own pressure, I would say. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know the whole story, but from what I can see, you know, in, if we look at President Biden's uh, political agenda and political calendars, uh, he's, run to his, he's going to run election and uh, he has to uh, face so many uh, domestic pressure from his, his own camps. Mm -hmm. So he had to work something on this. So they may, maybe this can partially explain why you know, they uh, you know, uh, took a somewhat uh, uh, conciliatory approach toward, uh, toward Beijing these days. Uh, Professor Huang, do you believe that this uh, softened tone against China is going to continue uh, on the U.S. side? Uh, you know, I would say in 2023, probably yes, uh, because um, keep the high tension between uh, Beijing and Washington is not in the interest uh, to the United States. Okay. Uh, and Beijing may also want to uh, tone down a little bit. But I, as I said, it's 2023. I, I believe that uh, from Beijing's mm -hmm. pe perspective, they wanted to see you know, whether the uh, elections in 2024 uh, in the United States, uh, what's the result? You know, what would be the next four years? And then they will make um, a, a kind of decision. But before that, I, I think um, they do not have the ability and uh, they do not want to mess up mm -hmm. with uh, the U.S. elections. Okay, uh, immediately related to that question is mm -hmm. the domestic parties in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And even that Lai Jin the emerges victorious in the upcoming presidential election, do you expect him to push even slightly toward Taiwan's independence? The Taiwan independence per se, mm -hmm. there are three obstacles. Number one, uh, it is not supported uh, and uh, it is not the policy of major powers around the world. Number two is that Beijing will react and probably bring uh, a war uh, across the Taiwan Strait. And the third obstacle is that our uh, you know, uh, constitutional amendment is with such a high threshold and it's even impossible uh, to make such a uh, constitutional change. Uh, having said all this, uh, away from all his previous stance and statement, uh, William Lai, uh, the vice president, did say that he will follow uh, President Tsai Ing-wen's approach to manage uh, Taiwan's national security. Uh, well, uh, we can take his words uh, in face value. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we will see you know, how other countries react to uh, his uh, remarks. And after all, <coughs> Uh, the current status quo is a high tension, highly uncertain, no shooting, uh, high um, problematic status quo. Uh, whether you know we would do uh, uh, you know push it to a, even a worse uh, scenario, uh, it's up to Taiwan's voters to determine. Okay, Professor Din. So. You know, could the president lie if he's ever elected, uh, ad adopt a similar stance like, like what Professor Huang suggested, uh, similar to uh, the current president Tsai Ing-wen? Well, I, I, I don't know, and uh, uh, I really don't know uh, president, uh, uh, vice president lie. But, uh, you know, from a as a person uh, living in a democratic institution system, mm -hmm. now we know that the, the election pattern and the model no, Professor uh, uh, Vice President Lai from the DPP. So when he was a uh, 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 political leader in, 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 the, in the local levels, if he want to run election, he know how to do it. The best way is to consolidate those <coughs> so-called deep green uh, camps, right? So that's, that's my partial explain why previously say I'm kind of a, uh, advocating town independence and the so-called practical uh, uh, Taiwan independent advocate, blah, blah, blah. But when he become a, a candidate, 
he need he know uh, he, he he know he need to expand his uh, uh, voters, so he might approach toward the center. So that's why you know he gradually uh, 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 toned down his previous tone, and gradually you know adopt uh, you know the presidential approach, and uh, try to maximize his vote. So um, I think you know president, uh, uh, vice president Lai or, or candidate Lai, he is a kind of smart person. He know uh, the, the the situation around the Taiwan, and I guess he has so many per people advising him, a very capable person advising advising him. So he know the the international security, and uh, he know mm -hmm. the expectation from the so called our the close friend. So I, I really don't know what he really want will do after you, if he he were elected. But I guess you know he really might. Uh, Maintain the president's size approach because probably this is the, the best safe way, safety approach, I would say, for him and for Taiwan. Okay, the last part, let's kind of consider the more broader picture for the future mm -hmm. of Taiwan. Do you, do you two scholars believe that uh, the Taiwan Strait will become more peaceful over the next 10 years or less? Vice President Lai's visit to Paraguay and the US mark increasingly normalized contact between the US and Taiwan. This is likely to be met with resistance from the CCP. In this episode, we've discussed the impact of the PLA's military threats on Taiwan's elections and examined the U.S. response. Did you enjoy our show? Leave us a message on our YouTube channel and subscribe to Taiwan Talks. I will see you soon.